Hi, and welcome to another episode of Ask on CYC. So today's episode is a special episode as we commemorate the victims who have died in the terrorist attacks in Paris, in Beirut, and in Baghdad. We pray for comfort for their families, and we pray for peace for the world. But we also want to know and have the right to understand why these terrorist attacks happen and what we can do about it. So today we have a special guest with us, um, who is a police officer, who is here on his own um, personal account, who is here to give us his own opinions on these issues and matters. So please, I'd like to introduce you to Albert Asilia. Welcome. Thank you. So Albert, so terrorism, so the world's awake now, the world's listening and the world's watching. So what is terrorism? It's a big question. Um, thinking about it before, what I come to realize is that basically there's two ways to understand what terrorism really is. There's the legal or dictionary definition of terrorism, and there's what the common person really understands terrorism to be. Terrorism in a legal sense is using violence or the threat of violence in order to induce political, religious, or social change on a group or on a community. Okay, so that's like the legal definition. What most of us though think of terrorism is bad people, who we don't like doing bad things to us. It's a bit different because as that saying goes, one man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter, but you know, there is a difference to understanding what terrorism is. But there is the legal definition, the way we can understand it in terms of law enforcement or the way governments think about it, which is that when I use violence, not for the end, not because I want that violent thing to occur, but because I'm trying to cause a change in some group, in some society, I want a government to change its policy, things like that. Okay. But for tonight's example, we're going to talk about the terrorist groups. Yep. For example, ISIS. Yeah. So we've been hearing a lot about them lately, but we don't actually know what their objectives are. What are their objectives? Or what's your opinion? About <laughs> well, you don't need to really have a, much of an opinion. You can just see what they've written about themselves and what they've said they want. Islamic State, ISIS, Daesh, ISIL, whatever their names, what are the names that people give them, are a uh, Sunni Muslim group that believe that they are practicing the purest form of Islam. And they want to establish an Islamic state or an Islamic society, first starting in Iraq, Syria, but expanding as much as possible. In order, part of their belief is in order to trigger the apocalypse. So they've interpreted an aspect of Islam where there will be a final confrontation between Muslims and the West, which will bring on the end days. So it's sort of dual. It has a goal for the earthly life and a goal for the afterlife. The afterlife one being they want to create the apocalypse basically. But they believe they are a Sunni Muslim group that want to install, institute and live pure Islam real Islam as they understand it and they're happy to do whatever needs to be done that's within their interpretation of Islam to get that done. Oh. Just a reminder to our viewers the phone number is 0412551292 so please send us your questions and we'll answer your questions live here on the show tonight thank you. So we've seen it happened recently in the past few weeks where it happened in Paris it also happened in Beirut and it happened in Baghdad um, but here we live here in Australia far away from all these countries but how safe are, re are we really here in Australia? Well I think we're infinitely more safer than a place like Baghdad uh, of course like with any sort of crime type no society can be perfectly safe that's the reality of, of the world we live in it's a sad reality. Now, we have experienced terrorism here in Australia. We have been the victims of terrorism, uh, most famously in the uh, Lint Siege Cafe, the Cafe Siege in Sydney uh, last year. We, are, we, we can be victims of it, but I, I think what we have to, as Australians, be careful of is not to 
overreact, not to think that the sky is falling, oh my God, but at the same time, not to think that, look, no, no, nothing like that could ever happen here. So we just be smart, be safe, be proactive. But being a further country from all these other countries and even from, you know, Syria and Libya, where ISIS have, you know, established, obviously it's going to take longer for them to reach Australian shores. Yeah, there's, you know, the blessing of the seas, you know. It's one of those things that as a, as a country we're very lucky to have, you know, we have, we're, we live on this big island. So, yes, of course, we're not in close proximity to the baddies, to, to ISIS, to where they are. Yes, it's going to be a lot more of a dangerous world to live in if you're living in Tripoli or Beirut or Baghdad or Cairo, as we've seen uh, that plane being blown up in Egypt recently. And ISIS supporters or a cell of ISIS in the Sinai were saying we, we were the ones that did it. So yes, of course, and that's normal, that's expected. Just like during World War II, Europe was a lot more of a dangerous place to be in versus Australia. But the inverse would be also true if we had an Australian homegrown terrorist organisation that wanted to change something in Australia, well, Australia would become very dangerous and Baghdad would be safe. So, yeah, that's, that's understandable. Sure. My next question is about a segment that I saw on the project by Walid Ali. He got up there and he made... Uh, he gave us his opinion on on this issue, uh, and he he was saying something on Channel Ten, the project. So he's saying that the terrorist group ISIS are taking claim for worldwide threats, even the, if these incidents were associated with them, in order to grow their cause and what they're about, and all and also create a worldwide fear. What's your opinion on that? He's right. He's actually right because what he did correctly was he quoted them. And that's what they said they were doing. They said to themselves, we'll take credit for things that we actually haven't done. It's really important. And that's the nature of propaganda. All, all organizations do, do that sort of thing. Any terrorist organization will want to amplify itself to make itself look scarier and bigger than what it is. Further to that, my own sort of view is, yes, we shouldn't fear ISIS as an organization that they are bigger than what we might think they are, just because there was an incident here in Australia, a terrorist incident, and ISIS make a claim for it, doesn't mean we should turn around and be scared in our beds and think, oh my God, ISIS, their reach is everywhere. Not in a direct way, but it is in an indirect way, because they asked their followers, they you know supported their followers in committing terrorist acts in whatever the way they wanted. Go and stab, go and stone, go and poison, Go and throw from tall buildings, the government officials, police officers, spies from these countries, Americans, Canadians, Australians, so on. We still should be concerned about that. We, sh we still should be concerned that anyone who, who does really believe in the message that Islamic State send, that they're going to take that directive onto themselves and say, okay, I'll go do it. So we, sh we still should be concerned. So whether these incidences that happen around the world were ISIS or not, do you think that these people who took their own lives for this cause are victims of brainwash of ISIS? That's a really important question. So you got to write, you know, we, we, people throw that term brainwashing out. It's an actual, there's a clinical understanding of like a psychological understanding of brainwashing. Brainwashing is when you take someone, you basically feed them messages and you condition them in really controlled environments especially like with cults or in societies like North Korea, closed <coughs> countries, no outside information, and you just pummel someone with certain ways, certain views about how the world should work. You know, these are our enemies. These are your friends. This is good. This is bad. And people are not exposed to other ideas. The reality is, is that for a Muslim in a country like Australia, they're not under those circumstances. They're not in those conditions. So I think we would be giving credit to an organisation like ISIS more than we should. They, they, they aren't that powerful that they can brainwash Australian Muslims or American Muslims. In the end, these people who support them are making their own choices. They're, they're absorbing information, information that the government, the society, um, 
local Muslim leaders are sending them and the message that ISIS is sending them. And they're making a decision. You know what, this message over here, that's more powerful for me. I, I believe that that's truth and therefore I'm going to act in that way. So I, I think we shouldn't give the label brainwashing to what ISIS are doing. Convincing, they're convincing people that their way is the right way. And in fact, that's more of a concern because people who are following ISIS coming from these Western societies are being convinced with all other information being available. So a young Muslim boy might watch a ISIS propaganda video and might say, oh, that's, that's, oh wow, that's really convincing argument. But they've got answers, they've got rebuttals, they've got another way of looking at the world right in front of them, but they may not choose to follow that. That'd be different to growing up in, say, Syria, living in the city of Raqqa, which is controlled by ISIS, and being in one of the ISIS schools, and then having certain messages being sent to you. That's more of an environment of brainwashing compared to what a, a Muslim in, say, Australia or America or England is facing. So, they, so you could just be saying that they're really good motivational speakers that could be encouraging these people? Like, for example, Hitler. He was a great speaker. That's right. That's right, and we, and we shouldn't take that away from them. We're, we're, actually, we're actually not understanding the problem. You know, when we talk about diagnosing, you know, in medicine, when they talk about diagnosing a problem, trying to figure out what the problem is, you can't, you can't bring a solution until you understand the problem. So again, we have to understand really what's happening. Reality is, is that ISIS are making religious arguments and they're making geopolitical arguments. You know? So they're making arguments based on the Qur'an, based on the Hadith, based on the historians of Islam, based on historical examples within Islamic history, and they're making geopolitical arguments. You know, they are invaders, you know, this is our people, who are they, they're taking our resources, they're destroying our wealth. They're making those sort of arguments. You know, and we have to understand that. And behind all that is a really amazing propaganda machine. Every expert, every expert, has said that the way ISIS frame and send out their message is top notch. Better than most governments, as good as Hollywood, as good as anything that Hollywood can produce. And I've, I've seen a lot of the ISIS propaganda videos, I've read their magazines, Darbuk, polished, really high quality, glossy magazines, you know, really um, video game style videos, Lots, lots of work, lots of effort there. The message can come across as convincing as anything that can come off the TV or the movies. And that's, that's powerful. That's what we've got to understand. That not only may the message might be powerful, but the medium, the way it's coming out is very powerful. And it fits in with the way we as a society have our messages. It's not like there's a guy in a white gown sitting in the, in the park screaming, follow ISIS, follow ISIS. They're using Twitter, they're using Facebook, they're sending out videos, you know, they're, 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 they're using the information mechanisms that we as a society create and use to tell people drive safely, to tell people this is a new law, to tell people vote for me, no vote for me, to tell people drink Coke, drink Pepsi. All those sort of mediums that we use to send out those messages, ISIS are using those as well. That's why it's receptive. That's why it's being absorbed a lot quicker than a lot of us realize. Even though the message to you and I and to most people on this planet is completely disagreeable. That's very interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Just to continue on with what Walid Ali said on the project, he said that ISIS is trying to cause a worldwide divisions between Muslims and Christians. And he goes, and the solution to this is for us to unite and, um, and show no fear. What's your opinion on that? It's correct. It's absolutely correct. It's not something ISIS have invented. Al-Qaeda before them were doing the same thing. They, in fact, talked a lot about the house of Islam and the house of war. And you're either with us or you're against us. It's a very typical message. It's a typical message that you'll find in any sort of dictatorial, top-down organisation, whether you're talking about ISIS, whether you're talking about Al-Qaeda, whether you're talking about the North Korean government, whether you're talking about the Soviets back in the day, doesn't matter who you're talking about. Hitler, the Nazis, there's us and there's them. 
So of course we have to unite because we are a pluralistic society. We are a society where there are lots of religions, lots, lots of ethnicities, lots of faiths, lots of different ways of looking of the world, looking at how does the world work? How do I want to live as a human being in Australia? How do I want to be? What do I want to do? Do I want to eat this? Do I want to drink that? Do I want to marry? Do I not want to marry? Do I want to pray in this direction or do I not want to pray at all? And these, this is the, the, the fortune we have as Australians or people living in the West to be free. And so, yeah, well, it's right. We have to take that freedom and, and not be scared, not be scared at all, to be more courageous than them, more in a way ferocious in our beliefs about how right we are as a pluralistic society, as an open and free society, and that we're more right than they are. Because if we show fear, we're almost sending a message that well, maybe you're right and I have something to be scared about. Isn't also... As Christians, isn't that what Christ taught us? To be people of peace and, not, and that we shall not fear? Yeah. And, and if you think about all the stories we get told as kids, right? Like, so, we, you know, we go to Sunday school, mum and dad tell us stories. What, what are the stories about? They're not, they're, not sto <clears throat> they're not stories about people being scared. <clears throat> Pardon me, I've got a cough there. They're stories about being courageous. It's stories about overcoming, going the extra mile. So why should we have fear? Everything about our faith, everything, whether it's Christ himself, his behavior, the disciples, the saints, the monks, the nuns, the church here, the church there. It's about <clears throat> being on the receiving end of violence, of oppression, of hatred, and overcoming that with love and not being fearful. Okay. We're going to go for a quick break and have a glass of water. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and we'll come back. We'll continue our discussion. Just a reminder to our viewers, please <coughs> send us your questions and we'll answer your questions live tonight on tonight's show. And you'll remain anonymous. So don't be shy and ask us questions about this interesting topic that's happening around us in the world. So for the phone number is 0416 551 292. Please send your questions, we'll answer them for you live when we come back from this break. Thank you. CYC Christian Youth Channel. Hi, and welcome back to CYC on the episode Ask on Terrorism and Should We Be Scared? So, we have with us Albert Asili who will continue our discussion on this topic. <coughs> so, we just got a question that came in from an audience member. They're asking, should we show hatred towards terrorists for what they are doing? In the end, they're people, the terrorists. So if we come, up, if we come at this as the Christians that we are, and we think about this logically, is there any caveat, any exemption in the Bible about who we should hate? You know, there's these famous memes with um, Jesus giving that talk about, you know, you should love your enemy, and then, you know, so, oh, but what if they're terrorists, you know, and Jesus says, did I stutter? Yeah. You know, and it proves the point. There is no brackets, asterisks, footnote one, <clears throat> love everyone, except the terrorists. <laughs> it doesn't say that. And there's a difference between what we are taught as Christians and what may be difficult to do. And I recognize it's hard. You know, I, I say this not as a person who's been the victim of terrorism. I haven't had my family killed by terrorists. So it's easy to talk about love, kindness, generosity when I haven't gone through that. But, I, but yes, our message, our goal is to love. And we have to recognize that there is a human being there. I always like to remind people when people sort of, you know, I, I hate Bin Laden and I'm happy he died. And I hate ISIS and I hope they all die in our own Bible in our own book, there is a person who behaved in such an awful way to us, to us Christians. And he ended up becoming the greatest preacher we ever had, Saul. Mm. When we actually think about what he did, think about it, what did he do? He held the cloak of those who were stoning Christians. He would actively go out and try to find Christians 
and say, there they are, kill them. Is that not terroristic in its nature? Is that not violent? Isn't that murderous? You know, if I told you a story now that, oh, there was a story in Egypt about a Muslim who would hold the cloaks of other Muslims while those other Muslims killed Christians. Yeah, you would say he's an evil man. Saul did bad things, yet he had his road to a Damascus moment. The Lord changed his heart, and he became the greatest preacher that we ever had. Mm. And it would have been a great loss if some Christian out there at the time took that situation into their own hands and killed him. Mm. Think about that. Wow. Think about that. <laughs> we would have lost St. Paul. Wow. You know, and so I always think, <clears throat> yes, of course, we as a society should defend ourselves. Absolutely. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying just open up the borders and allow ISIS to take over the country. Of course, that's silly. But I'm talking about what you should have in your heart, what I should have in my heart, what the billions of Christians on this planet should have in our hearts. And that is in the end to love. But to love is to understand. You have to understand who they are. Understand that they're coming from a place of pain. They're coming from a place that they're, I know it sounds crazy, but it's not. They're actually trying to right a wrong in their mind. They're, they're incorrect. They're wronging a right. But they, they're coming from a place that they feel is genuine. They're human beings still. And just hating on them and being happy that they die. That's their message. That's not our message. Let's keep our message. I'm not sure if you remember, but uh, there was an interview that went around to the parents of the 21 Coptic Christians that were martyred by <coughs> ISIS. Yeah. And the message <coughs> that these parents and families said in the interview, we forgive them, God bless them, we pray for them. Yeah. And, and they live in the faith. <laughs> like they're, they're, they, they have the right to hate. They have the right to hate. They're, they're, they're living as the true victims of terrorism. And yet their Christianity shone through. God bless them. Oh, wow. I, I can't say that I would do the same thing. I'd love to think I would. I don't know. I haven't been tested like that. But that's certainly a great goal, a great thing to look to and say, wow, that's the right way to be. Okay. So moving to the next question. So now Australia has made this claim um, where they have a strict screening process for the Syrians that are, have been allowed to enter <coughs> Australia. But is this screening, in your opinion, is this screening process a foolproof? It's a, it's a funny question, you know, because in the end, is anything foolproof? Uh. You know what I mean? I mean, we already screen refugees. We already screen immigrants. We screen in here and there for all sorts of processes. Nothing's foolproof. And I think that's where there's a danger as a society where we impose on the government this ridiculous ideal. I need you to foolproof the Syrian refugees coming or don't let any of them in. You can't, you know, you can't foolproof because you don't know. The way I would, again, if I had to take this as a, in a Christian perspective, do you foolproof the people you meet in your life? Do you foolproof them? I mean, do you go to a job and before you will talk to anyone, before you associate with anyone, look, I need to know who you are, I need to know your name, address, who are your parents, what did you do before this job? Look, before I can get friendly with you, before I can have a joke with you, before I can invite you over for a barbecue, I need to be foolproof. I need to have absolute proof that you in, in no way harm me. Do you do that? No. Do, would I do that? Does anyone do that? No. <clears throat> yeah, we have friendships. We have relationships with colleagues. We get married. We fall in love. We move into a neighborhood. We send our kids to a school over here. We do everything without it being full. Why here, why now? Why now? Because there's a fear, there's a fear inside. And so in a way, we're trying to sabotage the process by putting this ridiculous ideal on the government. Oh, for, you better full, you better make sure. If one of those trick, one of those students trick you, then it's your fault. Doesn't make any sense at all. Hold that thought. Yeah. We get a caller on the line. Cool. So we're going to allow a caller opportunity to ask a question. Yeah. So welcome, caller. Hi. G'day, caller. Hey, um, so I just got a question. Like, it appears that most capital cities in the world have been targeted by ISIS. 
Australia is next. What should we do to prepare? Yeah, okay. so I just missed that. What should we do to prepare? To prepare? Okay. Yeah. Now, it's a, it's a, in all honesty, it's a difficult question because when you say prepare, you know, are we just talking about what the government should do? Are we talking about law enforcement? Are we talking about, you, you know, you who is a non police officer? I really liked what the AFP Deputy Commissioner Neil Gagan said about terrorism. They said, you can't arrest your way out of terrorism. In the end, it's a social problem. And when I say social, I don't mean it's just a thing for social workers to work on. It's for the whole of society to work on. Yes, there is a place for spies. There's a place for law enforcement. There's a place for the courts. There's a place for jails. There's a place for laws. There's a place for immigration and border control. But there's also a place for education. There's also a place for community groups. There's also a place, very importantly, for Muslim leaders and Muslim community organisations who actually... I know it doesn't seem that way, but work really hard in a country like Australia to get to these kids, to get to these people, to try to counter the narrative. And also you, you, you know, to the listener, you, you, have a, you have a thing you can do. There's something you can do. Your very attitude can fuel the fire or suffocate the fire. You will never understand truly what instigates an ISIS supporter to do what they do. There are thousands of things that have probably happened in their life. Don't be so foolish to think that their life was perfect, everything was wonderful, ISIS sent one propaganda video, it twirled in their eyes and they said, okay, I'm gonna go blow myself up now in a cafe. That's not how it happens. You know, there's a lot of pain, there's a lot of suffering. There's, yes, there is being convinced about the message, but there's also something on the other side saying, I'm not treated well, I feel isolated, I feel there's no purpose here. Oh, I like ISIS's messages. Yes, this is what seems to be right here. So for the non-law enforcement, non-government part of the society, which is most of you, okay, what are you doing? How are you treating your Muslim neighbor? How are you treating that kid down the road that wants to play with your kid? Are you treating him like he's a terrorist? How do you think that that's gonna make him feel? Do you think that that's going to go against the ISIS message, that the, those Westerners, they don't like you, or it's going to support that message. I would suggest it's going to support that message. You know, If we have protests saying we want Muslims out of the country, aren't we just saying the very same message that ISIS is saying? Then why should we be surprised if droves of Muslims go into their hands? We, should, you know, we wouldn't be surprised. So we have an obligation, again, going back to that, Christian ideal is that we, we need to you know come out with the love we need to come out with the support we need to support those Muslims that are doing the right thing and that is the majority of them it really is it really is but there is something happening within the Islamic community in the West trying to find itself there's whole generations of Muslims coming up feeling displaced feeling like I don't know where I belong do I belong here do I belong there and ISIS are coming out with a message and it's a very powerful message our job, as the non-Muslims, the rest of the society, is to have another message, to say, you are welcome here. Absolutely, this is your country. We want you here, we want you at our footy games, we want you at our beaches, we want you in our jobs, we want you in our parliament, we want you, you know, at our barbecues. You, know, you, you, you belong here just as much as me. So our aim is to create that unity. Yeah, create it. Create that environment, create that space. And take away the fear that ISIS wants to inflict on us. Yeah, and, and, and the sense that <clears throat> you, in fact, don't belong here in Australia. You belong here with us in Syria and Iraq. We forget that that's part of their message. Mm. Part of their message is leave the lands of the Kufar. Leave the lands of the infidel. Come to our Islamic land, our pure land. This is where you belong. Now, no one's telling these young Muslim, Western Muslims that... There's, you know, electricity cuts out, there's not enough jobs, the water's dirty, the streets are dirty, there's no opportunities, you know. Life actually sucks there. It's really, really hard. It's not paradise. This is an infinitely better society. But what message are we saying? When we, in, you know, go to rallies and say, reclaim Australia, 
when we support politicians or wannabe politicians who say, no mosques and no halal and no, you know, this and no Islam and no Qurans and no... How are we, how are we saying, yeah, you do belong here? Mm. So it's something to consider. Yeah. Okay. So I wanted to ask, you mentioned before about the Lint Cafe incident and that was probably the one incident that we've had in Australia and yeah. recently. Do you think this is a, a wake-up call to Australia and the Australian government about, hey, it can reach Australia and we, we should be proactive about it? The Australian government were under no illusion that it couldn't happen. There was To suggest that the Lynn Cafe was a wake-up is ridiculous. Maybe it was a wake-up call to some Australian citizens. Maybe for them personally, they thought, oh, it can't happen here. This is Australia. But no one in government actually thought it couldn't happen here because law enforcement and the whole of government was doing things trying to avoid that very incident. You know? And it mm. was quite unique. It was obviously a surprise. There's a coronial happening, which is basically an investigation by a special part of the government to investigate these sort of matters. And they're going to come up and, and understand where did this come from? How did this happen? Because obviously it was sudden, it wasn't seen, it wasn't stopped. But yeah, I don't think anyone in government was under the illusion that we were, we are just somehow magically safe, that we have a magical anti-terrorism protective shield around us and terrorism can't happen here. We know. We know. Mm. Okay. So just one last question before we end the show. Yep. In your opinion, what's it, what's it, what can be the take home message that we take from this show like in regards to terrorism and the fear that it's created around us? Terrorism is a tactic, okay? It's not the end goal. If you understand that, then you need to understand, well, what is the goal? When, when you know, the IRA committed terrorist acts, was it because they actually loved killing English police officers? You know, when the Tamil Tigers killed Sri Lankan generals, was it because they loved murdering? No, of course not. That's ridiculous. We've created a narrative. Certain parts of the society have created a narrative that ISIS love death. They just love killing. They love blowing things up. They love stabbing people. And they love throwing people off buildings. And that's not what they love. There's the thing behind it. We want to create a pure Islamic state. We want to stop the American government and the Australian government and the English government from attacking our positions in Iraq and Syria. We want free reign. So remember, terrorism is violence or the threat of violence in order to create some political, religious or social change in a group, in a community, in a country, in a society. So you're trying to cause a change. So what's the message, like why does ISIS want to attack Australia? Because of our involvement in Iraq and Syria, because of our involvement supporting the Iraq government, because of our involvement in supporting the Americans. <coughs> so we have to understand that. Mm. We have to understand that. And so it's not just this message of death and then we have to respond with death, death with death. So if they have a message of death, we will we just kill them. That will solve the problem. That's not the point. That's not the point. That's not why they're doing what they're doing. You know? That's why it's really important that we have a whole of society approach. You know, my own personal belief is that we will never stop an Al Qaeda or an ISIS with our other Muslims. You know? You're just not gonna stop it. If you think that you as a non Muslim are gonna make an argument to ISIS about why they shouldn't be ISIS. You're kidding yourself. You know, such good Muslims out there, people I've met, people I've dealt with, Muslim sheikhs, who are constantly going out there and saying to these, saying to young people, saying to adults, no, ISIS message is wrong. It's not real Islam. It's not for me. I'm not a Muslim. So in a way, it's irrelevant if I say ISIS is real Islam. You know how people are doing that? I see it on my Facebook feed. ISIS is real Islam, and here's a verse from the Quran to prove it. And someone else comes again. No, 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 no. ISIS is not. Are you Muslim? Oh. So, 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 who are you to talk about what real Islam is or is not? 
for me, that's that's where the great work that the Muslim community do is really important. So that's it's trying to trigger something in your mind, which is that there isn't one magic silver bullet. Your police or more education. You've got to use everything. You've got to use every tool in your arsenal to solve this problem. The military can, can be good, but it can only do so much. It could stop an ISIS tank, but it cannot change an ISIS heart. Mm. You know what I'm saying? You know? So yeah. that's, that's probably the best thing to take away from it, I hope. But it's a big subject, and it's not something above anyone's brain. Think about it. Talk about it with others. And come at it with an open mind. And always, always, always remember, they're people. They are humans. As much as it's great and easy to just think of ISIS members as barbarians and dogs and we should just kill them all, they're people, they're humans. And if you recognise that, you can recognise that they could change their mind. They could change just as much as Saul changed into a Paul. They can change. Mm, okay. Sorry, I was just going to end the show, but we just got a couple of questions that yeah. just came in from the audience members. And you know how we're about answering the questions of the audience. Yeah, so yeah. They got all priority. So the first question that came in is, what are your thoughts on people that want to close the borders on refugees <coughs> for fear of terrorists? Uh, as I said before, there's lots to fear. You know, There's uh, terrorists, there's murderers, there's rapists, there's fraudsters, there's people who could get drunk and drive over your son. Sh should we stop the border for them? Why for the terrorists? Why should we stop borders? Why should we close borders? Because we're scared that a couple of terrorists might come through. I mean, does quarantine stop the borders because maybe, maybe a disease might get through? Or do we have quarantine officers at our borders to try to weed out those dangerous things? But they're two different examples. Where Why? a terrorist, if he's going to kill someone, he'll try to aim to kill thousands. Whereas a guy who run over someone by a car is just one... One guy, you know. Yeah, but I mean, in the end, one terrorist might kill, say, a hundred by himself, but a hundred drunk drivers might kill a hundred. So you get the same response. In the end, well, there's a couple of things to remember. First off, with that, we have signed a UN convention regarding refugees, so we actually have a legal obligation. We have a legal obligation to accept refugees. Mm. So we would be actually going against our own law if we refused refugees. Second off, how does that match our faith? You know, there was this brilliant piece that Stephen Colbert, he's on, he took over David Letterman's uh, show, The Late Show in America. And he was, um, he was just sort of mocking the people who claim to be Christians, you know, and he said, you know, didn't Jesus say basically, you know, the skit went something like, you know, he said, if I'm hungry, you know, give me food, if I'm thirsty, then give. and if I'm like lonely, then, you know, or homeless, then, you know, and the, and the rest of the verse is, let me in. You know, our, our job as Christians is to take those without homes and let them in. Maybe that's not something that you could do with your home right now, but that's certainly something we can do with our country. We should still be careful. It doesn't mean that we just allow five million people in with our eyes closed. Of course we should be careful. Of course we should screen. Of course we, we should take precautions. But to go to the other extreme, to say we'll take no one because we're scared, a maybe. Again, that's the thing that you were pointing out before about Walid Ali was saying that we shouldn't have fear. Then we've allowed, we've allowed ourselves to become fearful rather than being courageous. If our system of society is so weak that we need to behave in this way, well, why have it? If and if we reject them as a society, maybe <coughs> they'll find another society that will accept them, which could be ISIS. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And it's funny because that's the message ISIS is saying. Don't, why are you leaving? Why are you leaving? They don't even want you. Here, here's the message coming out of France. Here's the message coming out of America. Here's the message coming out of Canada. And they pick, of course, the most racist fanatics from those societies. Here's the message coming out of Australia. They don't want you. you know? Someone like Pauline Hanson, <clears throat> her message falls right into the hands of ISIS. They can put up that poster, translate it into Arabic, and it would be the best propaganda poster. 
look at this woman. She used to be a member of parliament in Australia. And she's sending out a message. No mosques, no halal, no Muslims, no Quran, no, we don't want you here. Don't go. It's not your place. But there, there are Syrian refugees, genuine refugees. Their country's been smashed. It's the worst refugee crisis from what I've been reading. The worst refugee crisis since World War II. Let that sink into you. This isn't some small thing. This is the worst refugee crisis since World War II. Speaking, was our, speaking our of World War II, actually, <laughs> yeah. the next question that came in, they're actually asking, in your opinion, are we heading towards World War III? Like, uh, with, it says, are we heading into a World War III, a war against terrorists? No. Think about the first two World Wars. They were between great powers. Mm. ISIS is not a great power. Yeah. If somehow we got into a war with Russia, China, and America, then that's a world war. You know, World War II was between the big players, the big boys in the field. ISIS militarily are nothing, are weak, mm. but they're in a really fragile place in the world. That's why they cause so much havoc, you know? And if you understand the geopolitics of the environment, of the situation, you can understand why they can't just be wiped out. You know, people always say, why can't we just send the military in and wipe them out? Because <clears throat> you've got Assad, you've got the Iranians over here, you've got Sunni rebels, you've got the Iraq government, you've got the Israelis over here, the Egyptians. Are... It's complicated. But militarily, ten nothing. Mm. They, f from a Western perspective. I mean, if Russia just went in and said, okay, we're going to clean the slate of ISIS. They wipe them out. What they've been doing to ISIS militarily is destructive. No, it's not going to be a World War III. <laughs> Again, that's... <clears throat> we're falling into the fear. We're giving ISIS more power than what they have. We're making them a bigger beast than what they really are. What they are are cunning adversaries, smart adversaries who have taken advantage of a power vacuum after the Americans left Iraq, who are taking advantage of a fight between a Shia minority in Syria and an oppressed Sunni majority. They're taking, it's geopolitics. You know, let's not fantasize about the apocalypse with ISIS. They call it, you know, the end game and we call it World War III. Let's not go there. It's not. It really isn't. It's a terrible situation. Millions of people are being displaced. Hundreds of thousands will die because of this overall, <clears throat> on all sides, Iraqis, Syrians, and, and all the people who are the victims of ISIS terrorist acts all over the world, whether that's in Egypt, whether that's in Libya, whether that's in Paris, whether that's here, even if it's one person. I mean, those, those people are suffering because of it. Let's deal with it as it is rather than what we are scared it might be and, and sort of dwell, dwell into a fantasy place that it really isn't. Mm. Okay. That's all we have time for tonight's cool. show. And I'd like to thank you very much for your insight on this no topic. No worries. Uh, and I'd like to thank the viewers for tuning in and asking their questions. So please tune in next week for our next episode and ask the question because if you don't ask, you will not know the answer. So I'm Mean Ibrahim from CYC Studios in Sydney. Good night and God bless. CYC Christian Youth Channel. The name CYC is very nice name. <laughs> nice name.